thank you again, uh, Claire and Colette, for being together this series. Um, yeah, the Royal Institute for Navigation and the Cognab group in particular have been great to interact with. And it's my pleasure to be able to launch this year's series. Uh, as it says, I'm going to be talking about human navigation without vision, uh, seeing with our ears and tongues to advances in sensory substitution and augmented reality. So a little bit about me. Uh, so at the University of Bath, um, that's how we say it in Bath too, uh, I direct the Crossmodal Cognition Lab and we are an interdisciplinary group housed in the Department of Psychology, but with uh, a lot of collaborators, PhD students and NGD students in computer science at the university who are part of the lab. Uh, here we are in front of uh, our newish psychology building, just a few years old on the campus. Um, back when we had a, a big sign up about some of our research on seeing with sound, um, one of the big collaborators who inspired me and got me interested in seeing with sound is uh, in the audience today, uh, Peter Mayer, uh, which is great to see you. Hi, Peter. Um, and Hi, Michael. Yeah, I'm glad you can make it. Um, and, and you'll hear a little bit about what Peter uh, invented uh, later in the talk. Um, and at the University of Bath, we have a, a number of things that help support our work. Should we have um, slides, Michael? Sorry? Should we have some slides up yet? Or are we just Oh, on yes, place? sorry. Would you like to change, uh, change screen? I, I can see it just fine. But... I'm sure it looks great for you. We can't <laughs> see it just yet. But it is lovely to just have a head as well. Thank you. Yep, there you go. Um, yeah, so just to see some of the members of the group who are there the day that we uh, took the photograph, um, doing a, a number of colleagues at the University of Bath, but also at Bath Spa University and now at the University of Bolton, uh, where uh, Dr. Dave Brown is now a lecturer in psychology. Um, also part of and one of the founders of Reveal, which is a research center we have for real and virtual environments augmentation labs. Uh, and I'm a co-investigator for CAMERA, which is a UKRI research center uh, looking across all different aspects of motion tracking and virtual environments. Uh, and one part that's been really helpful in a lot of my work into spatial cognition applications uh, has been funding in collaboration with Atkins, uh, working in particular with their human-centered design uh, architecture team, uh, which is a great group. And as Colette mentioned uh, in the beginning, um, I'm currently over at what's now called Meta uh, since the big name change uh, at the end of last year. I'm still waiting for the new logo for Reality Labs Research, which is where I'm based for a two-year sabbatical, um, working um, primarily uh, in vision. So with the eye tracking team in particular and how eye tracking can be integrated uh, across a number of applications and a number of other sorts of things we like to track like hands, heads, bodies, uh, as people interact in various spaces. Uh, and so far it's been great uh, working with the team. It's really fascinating to see how things work on uh, this side, on the industrial side of things. So a core fundamental question uh, that underlies a lot of my research, um, whether it's looking at uh, these sorts of devices that can uh, assist people who have visual impairments, or whether it's looking at the eye tracking side of research that I'm doing over here at research, um, at Reality Labs Research, uh, is this sort of simple question. What does it mean to see? Now, in some ways, it's probably sort of deceptively simplistic, right? Because on the one hand, you could probably ask, you know, any young person, what does it mean to see? And I'll have some easy answer for you. Uh, you ask a, a vision scientist or an engineer, you might get a very different answer. Um, but I think it's fundamental for being able to understand a lot of things, particularly when doing research on humans, as most of my research is, uh, because we are such a visual species. You know, we rely on vision to incredible degree. Um, we have one of the highest visual acuities for mammals, um, which is pretty exceptional and sort of shows the importance of it and the amount of processing in the brain that we dedicate to it, uh, something incredibly important to us, which is why something like visual impairments are so fascinating 
because you'll have people with a visual impairment trying to interact with the world designed by a bunch of other people who uh, might be able to see quite well. Uh, but in thinking about this question and different approaches to it, you know, it's something that's been important to define for a long time. And you know, I love this, there's a memo from the Artificial Intelligence Group at MIT back in 1966, uh, when they defined something as the Summer Vision Project, uh, with their idea that they would put a bunch of just summer workers towards um, handling computer vision. And their definition of what it meant to see, at least for this project, was pattern recognition. And um, you know, if you think about the computers back then in the 60s, you know, which were taking up whole rooms to be able to run computations, uh, you know, it's quite an ambitious project just for a single summer. And unfortunately, they didn't solve the problem of vision in that single summer. It's something in terms of animal vision. Uh, much less computer vision, we're still trying to come to grips with today. But um, someone who comes out of that same tradition at MIT, the late great David Marr, uh, in his wonderful book, Vision, um, approached this question in his introduction as the plain man's answer to it, and Aristotle's too, would be to know what is where by looking. So it's, it's simple in some ways. It has two component parts, what and where, um, and basing that in the act of looking to receive that information. Uh, that memo, of course, is focusing much more on the, the what aspect in some ways. Uh, so pattern recognition being some way of identifying what the pattern is. Um, but of course, the where aspect is incredibly important, even for that, you know, because in order to know what something is, to some extent, you have to know where it is so you can process the information at that location in order to identify it. Uh, so it's, it doesn't really cover everything. So if you actually do ask people what it means to them to see, a lot of times people say a bunch of other things, things that seem much more high level, much more emotional, but I think they all probably take root in sort of this simpler answer uh, before we're able to get to the level of the more complex aspects of vision. And vision is something funny because it happens so quick and it seems so effortless to us as human adults that we kind of take for granted how much processing is required to take all this information that's coming in and activating the cells on our retina in order to get to the level of knowing what something is and where something is. You know, we seem to do it without effort. We seem to do it quickly and automatically but there's really a lot going on uh, that we need to understand. So we see, hear, touch, taste, smell, and experience all of our senses in the brain. I, this sounds obvious, but um, it's important to realize that a lot of the really interesting processing that allows us to see or to more broadly to perceive is happening through all these computations in the brain. So obviously we use the eyes, ears, fingers, mouth, nose to bring in the information from the environment. But all the really interesting processing that takes place to allow us to actually have these perceptual experiences is taking place in the brain. And so there's an important idea that comes out of that. Um, and I think it was best stated by Paul Bakirita, whose work I'll mention later on sensory substitution that um, because all of this happens in the brain, one way you can think about it is that if we're deprived of one sense, so if you have some peripheral damage, say to the eyes, to the ears, well, the other senses can compensate or even substitute for the missing sensory modality, as long as we're gathering that information we need and getting it to the brain. So it's sort of an important idea for thinking about how we can possibly substitute one sense for another particularly when thinking about something as complex and fascinating as navigation. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to talk about how visual impairments inspired my research into understanding atypical augmented reality, uh, which is essentially these sensory substitution devices or augmentation, sensory augmentation devices, um, which serves as an excellent means for understanding the basics of spatial cognition. 
And this will be through, as I described in the sort of subtitle of my talk, translating images into displays that could be heard or touched. So at the core of this comes uh, a bunch of research over the years that has demonstrated the importance of visual experience for cognition broadly. And that's because a lot of work has shown that visual deprivation, such as through being visually impaired, either uh, from birth or becoming visually impaired later in life, um, other lines of work in terms of hearing impairments uh, have found other changes that occur there. Um, but having that deprivation of vision changes spatial uh, and multisensory processing. And it's particularly interesting in terms of spatial cognition and navigation. And so more broadly, in looking at like that navigation literature, for example, uh, a lot of work looking at people who have visual impairments have noted there is this uh, root knowledge preference, for example, over survey knowledge. So more of an interest in knowing the route one takes left and right turns from A, get from A to B, um, rather than having sort of an allocentric map-like knowledge or survey-like knowledge for the location of things. And part of this does seem to come down to multi-century integration, because as one interacts with space, it usually involves several senses and several ways of gathering information. And so vision being so important for humans seems to be important for sort of gluing together the experiences of space, the, the sound of a space, uh, the feeling of a space, the way we have uh, proprioception, the body movement of our body through that space. Uh, vision seems to be very important for sort of gluing all that information together. And that's why visual experience seems to have played such an important role in the basis of spatial cognition in humans. And one aspect I'll use as a case study for some of that um, is thinking about the different reference frames we use to understand space. And some of this is related to this idea of, say, root knowledge versus survey knowledge being uh, useful and having different preferences for those, depending on whether a person is with sight uh, or has a visual impairment. And one idea that maps onto this idea of root versus survey knowledge is allocentric versus egocentric spatial reference frames. So egocentric, of course, is a term we know well, usually more used as a personality description of people. Um, and the idea there is, is similar to root knowledge. It's having a representation of where things are in space based on your personal location and perspective. And so you'll have some way of knowing where things are relevant to where you are and your perception of them. Uh, in contrast, more in line with this survey knowledge or map-like knowledge idea is you can have these allocentric spatial reference frames where instead your knowledge of where things are is their locations relevant to one another, sort of independent of your perspective that you may have. And a lot of work has looked at this primarily in vision, um, but there's increasing uh, number of papers that are looking at this in terms of the other senses as well. And I'll describe some of our work in this area too. So before I get to that, why would visual experience have this impact on how we think about space? And one way to think about it is this clear link between visual experience and different forms of mapping space. And one way to think about it is that one of the earliest levels of representing space uh, in the brain is this relationship between the presentation of visual information on the retina and a direct mapping of that into the first areas of cortex, primary visual cortex, that that visual information reaches. And within primary visual cortex, so if you look on the right here, you'll see it at the back of the brain. So this is the front on the left. This is the back on the right. Uh, and you have these multicolored areas along here that are representing different parts of the visual field that are presented to someone. And 
what's amazing to see is this nice relationship where the retina is mapped onto the visual cortex and a number of other visual areas in a um, spatiotopic way. So you have this sort of direct relation to where things are in space, their uh, processing at the retina, and then a mapping of that in the brain. And so you have these spatial maps directly present there that will let you know where something is being uh, presented to the one who's seeing it. And there's also this, this work here, for example, which has directly looked at this uh, in the brain of uh, monkey, the macaque monkey, cats, for example, among other species, where using tracers that lead directly from the retina to the brain, you can see how the presentation of sort of this bullseye stimulus um, creates this clear mapping that you can see back there. Now, what's interesting is so visual experience has been known for a long time to be necessary to some extent for the full development or maintenance uh, of these maps that are present in the brain. Um, they still exist. A, a lot of them are still sort of laid down developmentally in the absence of visual experience. Um, but there's definitely some sort of plasticity in the brain where because they're not used, they aren't necessarily fully maintained uh, through adulthood in the absence of any visual experience. So that's one way visual experience is important for sort of spatial mapping in terms of how the brain might be able to represent it. Um, another is just thinking about what vision is good for. And one reason vision is so useful for us as humans uh, is that it is a great way to be able to access and represent silent objects that are distal, so they're far away from you, so not something you can necessarily touch. You know, we can see a star and have an idea of its location. Um, and also vision's good at parallel processing. So we can process information to a certain extent from across the visual field in parallel. For example, if you want to, um, depending on what sort of football team you might be a fan on, let's say your team wears uh, red, uh, you can pay attention to the color red and sort of in parallel pick up on those locations. So then you can make an eye movement to the different uh, people wearing red to find, say, the player that has the ball. And so you can do some of these things in parallel. And so vision is also good for that. And this way of representing things that are far away and representing things in parallel is incredibly useful for something like this allocentric reference frame that I described earlier. Because one way of being able to do that is having to have access to this information of where things are related to one another in some parallel uh, acquisition sense. But let's put this in the context of a study. So um, a lot of work by McNamara, including this work um, with Moon colleagues, have looked at the role of vision for representing space uh, in terms of egocentric reference frames and allocentric reference frames. Um, one way to do this, um, you can do this, of course, outdoors, representing, say, buildings in a city. Um, but easier way to manipulate it is in a room with objects in front of you. And one way they'll go ahead and present this is they'll have a person standing in one location. And so acquiring the information visually about where the information is and trying to remember the location of the objects. So remembering what and where, and then testing their ability to remember that. And they'll test their ability in two ways. One is this egocentric condition where they'll ask them to imagine later, so there's a memory test for the locations, um, the locations of the objects related to other objects within the uh, display here. And so people will be asked to, for example, imagine you're at the banana, facing the frying pan, now point to the book. And so it'll be consistent with the way in which they acquired the information from this egocentric perspective. Uh, but in the memory test, they'll do a manipulation as well, where they'll ask them to do a different view that doesn't align from the one that they actually saw. So they actually saw the object physically in the room from this angle that you're seeing the photograph. But then the test will also ask them to sort of mentally rotate themselves in the space 
And instead, imagine they're perhaps still at the location of the banana, but this time facing the scissors, and then they need to point to the location of the book. And so the task turns from just remembering what looked like from your egocentric perspective to having to understand the location of the objects related to one another to shift your perspective and then be able to represent the locations accurately. Now, in those vision tests, you essentially see this sort of sawtooth pattern that you see here, where people perform more accurately in the conditions that are allocentrically defined. And they surprisingly perform worse at the conditions that are egocentrically defined. Now, one reason for that, if we look back here at the objects, is that in order to encourage this allocentric reference frame and to allow it to be successful, you'll notice you'll have these nice rows and columns that are coming from this oblique angle uh, instead of this more haphazard diamond shape that's coming from this egocentric angle. And so it looks like in vision, people sort of automatically just represent the objects in relation to one another uh, to such an extent that they'll actually perform better from viewpoints that give them this metric in this allocentric reference frame, um, and even better than they would from the actual direction they saw the items. Now, what you're actually seeing here is a slightly different data set. And in this one, because we're interested in visual experience, what we did was we blindfolded sighted participants. And instead of allowing them to see the objects, we took them from this location at the bottom of the screen and went to each object and back to the origin, to another object, back to the origin, again and again, until they walked to each location, felt the object to recognize what it was, and then they were tested on their memory for the scene through this method of acquiring the information through proprioception, walking, and through touch as they felt the object to find out its identity. And so what's interesting here is we found the exact same pattern of results that you would find as if they had seen them. So they still seem to pick up on this allocentrically defined metric for the locations of the objects, and they perform better in this memory task in terms of being able to point to where the objects were in relation to one another. So even though they were blindfolded, they still seem to form this idea of the allocentric relationship of the objects. So then we also tested people who had visual experience earlier in life, but became visually impaired later in life, profoundly visually impaired. And in this late blind group, we essentially found the same pattern as the sighted group. So they also, in the same task of walking to the objects and feeling them, um, had better performance for the allocentric condition than for the egocentric condition. So rather than using the starting point of where they walked from to remember where the objects were, they seemed to pick up on this survey-like representation of where the objects were. The last group we studied were those who had no visual experience. Uh, and so this is a group of people who were congenitally blind and therefore never had any visual experience to form up some of these mental maps of the world. And this group had the opposite pattern of effects from those who had visual experience. So here what we see is they perform better in the egocentric conditions than in the allocentric condition. And so this aligns well with this prior work that had shown that uh, those who are congenitally visually impaired have this preference for root knowledge for using ideas about their egocentric perspective for moving between locations to remember those locations, instead of picking up on the allocentric structure, which might be more similar to like a survey representation that you could have. And so overall, this contributes to this idea that visual experience, so all these people are not seeing in this task, um, but the two groups, the late blind and sighted, have had visual experience during development. The congenitally blind group has not. And that visual experience seems to influence these, these preferences that people have 
in terms of being able to spatially represent the locations of things. Now, I'm going to shift a little bit to discuss technological approaches for thinking about how we could provide visual experience to those without it. So one thing I'll, I'll go back just to mention is you'll notice that all of the points here are kind of overlapping. It's just the pattern has changed. And so one group did not perform better than another. They all performed at the same level overall. It's just the pattern of when they perform better seemed to change. But you can imagine there might be some situations where having an egocentric reference frame might be incredibly useful and others where an allocentric reference frame might be incredibly useful. And so my idea here is whether it's possible to give some visual experience to those who have congenital visual impairments um, in order to help enable that sort of allocentric processing. But how can we do that? Well, one approach I'm going to describe is sensory substitution. So going back to what I discussed in the beginning, it's this idea that if one sense is impaired, perhaps we can substitute another sense to provide the information to the brain that otherwise would be provided by that sense. And so this is largely done with what are essentially augmented reality devices. Uh, and the examples I'll describe are seeing with sound or the tongue. And we have a, a news article from a while back uh, in the Observer and the Guardian that described uh, some of our work using the voice that you see here, V-O-I-C-E, uh, which is the uh, device that was invented by one of our um, audience members here, uh, Peter Mayer uh, from the Netherlands. Now, when trying to think about how you could turn images into something that could be processed by another sense, substituting for vision, you come to, for me, as someone who studies psychology, neuroscience, and computer science, um, a huge information processing challenge. So there's different estimates of how much information the different senses can process. Uh, vision, as I mentioned earlier, like in humans, we have great spatial acuity. Um, we're able to process a lot of information per second with some old estimates that actually converge with some estimates uh, in neuroecology uh, as well. And we're able to do that more or less in parallel. Now, one of the first century substitutions uh, chose tactile or touch processing as a way to access image information, uh, in part because it's easy to imagine to some extent. So you can think of the skin as a spatial analog to the retina. So for example, if I was just to present you know, these letters on the screen to your retina, you can imagine how the light enters the eye and then you essentially have that image of the letter on the back of the retina. Um, similarly, you can play a game where you write letters, say, on someone's hand, and you have this spatial analog to being able to feel the letters, kind of in the same way the retina is processing the visual information of the letters. But our, our touch system uh, has lower acuity than vision. Um, it processes a lot less information per second than vision, and across a lot of studies, they seem to suggest that a lot of this touch processing is serial. So rather than being able to process a lot in parallel, we're sort of restricted to how much information we can process at any given moment in time. So Paul Bakirita, who I mentioned in the beginning, um, created one of these first century substitution devices uh, as an image from their work in the 60s, where the image is taken by a camera, uh, processed back here to take the pixels in that uh, black and white image. And then you could feel it on your back. You can see all these sort of little solenoids here on this uh, dental-like chair, um, where then if there was, say, a circle shown in front of the camera, like a ball, you would feel that shape on your back with the size of it changing, depending on how close the ball was to the camera lens. Uh, nowadays, coming out of that same tradition, um, ended up the researchers coming out of Bakirita's tradition formed a company uh, which has created something called the brain port. Um, so we have an older version down here. So essentially you have glasses with a camera right above the nose and a processing unit that converts the image into these pixels, um, which are then felt on the tongue. I'll show you a little close-up of this tongue unit here. 
Uh, this is one of the new units um, that we have in the lab. And so the basic idea is you have this on your tongue. It is providing just a little bit of electrical stimulation. Uh, and so the tongue's a good place because the saliva helps conduct electricity, so it doesn't have to be too strong. And if you were looking at an image of a bar on a screen, you essentially feel that uh, diagonal bar across your tongue. Uh, and it's a really interesting experience. Um, it kind of reminds me something like popping candy. I don't know if you've had that before, um, where you put the candy on your tongue, you kind of feel it popping in different ways. Um, and we've done some work trying to understand the different important aspects of how people are able to read things on their tongue. Um, and in particular, dealing with the strange orientation of feeling uh, information coming from a camera turned onto your tongue, which also is influenced by the sensitivity of the tongue as well. But there are these drawbacks, right? So the acuity is not very good. The amount of information process isn't as good. And so then thinking about processing sound or auditory system uh, becomes a really interesting idea. Um, so a few reasons why it's so good. Well, temporal acuity is very good. Um, it's known that we have very uh, good sensitivity, the timing differences, little differences in timing. Uh, we have very good uh, sound localization. Um, this is something actually uh, this team called the Hefners have looked at um, across uh, mammals and seen this relationship between having sort of highly sensitive uh, foveal vision like humans have. So we have a very sensitive reason at the sort of center of our retina and uh, sound localization ability. So uh, animals like us can use localizing sound as a way to turn our eyes to the right location to be able to localize where the sound's coming from and identify its source. So there's a multi-sensory link here, that's crucial. And so we're, we're good at sound localization as well. Uh, you can process more information in sound than you can in touch, still less than vision, but it's getting you much closer to that level of information processing. Uh, but the problem is how can we provide visual spatial information through sound, right? Doing this in touch seems more obvious. Doing it in sound really takes a, a bit of a creative leap. So one way to think about it is the first, let's just do a little experiment here. Um, each of these shapes has a name. One of these is called Kiki and one is called Booba. And perhaps you can just put something in the chat or just think the answer to yourself. Um, what do you think this first shape is called? Would you call this one Kiki or Booba? See response coming in um, saying Booba and someone else says definitely Booba. Um, and I can't say you're right or wrong necessarily, but I will note that that's consistent with what over 90% of people say. So most people name this spiky object as Kiki, and therefore this object over here, the softer edges, as Booba. And this has been found through different developmental ages. Uh, it's been found cross-culturally uh, with this team of Japanese researchers um, we work with uh, doing some work in uh, Northern Malaysia, uh, it's a really consistent effect. So there seems to be this correspondence between the sound of the word, kiki or buba, and the look, the sight of these shapes. So there are links between what we see and what we hear. And you see this across our sensory modality as well. And so let's think about the image in terms of these sort of cross modal responses. Now, obviously an image is much more complex. Uh, this is from a photo taken by uh, Pranav Lal, um, who is a, um, a user of this voice device um, I'll be describing uh, in India and took some photos up around the Himalayas and we're doing a lot of amazing work with the device taking photos. Um, and in this photo, you know, if you just think about his information, one easy way to break it down to think about pixels in the image, I just represented by large squares here. And what is present in these different parts of the image? Well, if you take one square over here at the left, 
you can think about its y and x axis locations, it's low to the left, and its luminance is dark. If we go over here to pick another pixel, uh, on the y axis it's high, x axis is to the right, and its luminance is bright. So if we think about different cross-modal cross correspondences that exist for these sorts of spatial relations and to the brightness of an image, um, we know that we have associations between the height of space and pitch. So you can have a high frequency or high pitch sound representing this one. Uh, in terms of space on the x-axis, like I said, we're good at sound localization. So you can represent it to the right ear. And we also have this association that brighter lights are associated with louder sounds. The amplitudes seem to be linked for us cross modally. Um, and this one down over here, y-axis is low, so it could be low pitch. You could hear it more in your left ear with stereo tuning, and it's dark, so it could be quiet. Um, just look at a quick question. I'll save that one to the end. Uh, and come back to that one sometime. Okay, and the other thing we can do to try and mitigate this problem of vision being able to sort of take things in in parallel, um, but to reduce the amount of information having to be processed at any point is add a temporal feature. And so another thing we can do is scan the image in terms of the columns from left to right. And in that way, taking advantage of this sensitivity to timing that the auditory system is good at, and you can just worry about processing the information at any given one point and then integrating it across the image as a way of being able to reduce the complexity a little bit. And so you'll scan across the image. You'll hear things that are high in the image as high pitches, things that are low as low pitches. And also if you have stereo uh, earphones on, you can hear things on the left and the left, things on the right on the right. So I'll give you an example from a video we made for new scientists when they covered uh, Pranov's uh, pictures that he takes when he goes on holiday and uh, travels and such. And this will let you hear what the voice created by Peter Mayer sounds like. So hopefully you can hear that okay. You'll hear a high pitch as it scans across the flat line a low pitch as it goes across the flat line at the bottom. Here, as it scans across, you'll hear a change in pitch. So you should be getting that direct sense of it going up as it goes up in pitch and going down as it goes down in pitch from left to right. Now, of course, what you hear is the complexity of real images compared to these simple shapes. Uh, it's very representative of the complexity of the world. You know, the world has a lot of information within it. And once you think about it in terms of trying to translate the sound, hopefully you can pick up on the complexity that when we see, we might take for granted. Now I like that one because you can hear the pitch sort of dropping as it's following this drop in elevation here. And there's just an example of augmentation as well. Okay, so going back to that reference frame study um, we did before, uh, my postdoc, uh, Akile, and a former PhD student, Typhoon, um, went on to examine um, whether using the voice to provide a way of seeing the scene would mimic what you see in terms of visual experience. And indeed, what they found was exactly that. Um, so for some reason, their graph alignment starts at 315. We start with zero here. You'll see that's the lowest point, um, which corresponds to what sighted and late blind people did. And so this pattern of results matches what people do when they can actually see the scene. But the crucial thing is that they didn't actually see it with their eyes. In this case, they saw it with their ears and with hearing. Um, what's the catch? Well, one thing that's sometimes a challenge is it takes learning. You know, so when we look, think about vision, 
we've had our whole infancy to learn to see and our interactions with the world and with the other senses. And when doing more complex tasks that get to the level of something like navigation, um, we need to take people through periods of training to learn to use this new auditory input as something that provides them this rich information about the environment. Now we do things um, essentially to make it simpler. So we have this all black room, which is our um, virtual reality and motion tracking lab. And we present these uh, high contrast objects, you know, shown in white across the background to make sure people are able to focus on learning the locations of things. Um, but that gives us an opportunity after training to be able to examine how people can integrate things like seeing with sound through the voice, along with other things like self motion. So the normal way you might remember where objects are, as we did in our prior studies, is that movement to them as a way of representing them. And then there's different ways we can test that either egocentrically, so on the left here, having people remember how to get to a location of object from their starting point, their perspective, um, or allocentrically, where they're shifted to a starting point of another object and therefore have to be able to calculate how you get from each object to each other object rather than from their e egocentric starting location. Uh, just give a couple examples of some of the data that we found so far along these lines. And one thing I think is exciting is uh, doing comparisons between those who are sighted versus those who are visually impaired and finding that um, participants are able to uh, efficiently integrate using the voice to hear the environment with self-motion information. Uh, and that's what you see by having sort of the lowest um, variability in their error. So their precision gets very good and it gets to the level of ideally being able to integrate the two forms of input. So seeing with sound, and with their self-motion of walking through the environment. Uh, and they were performing better than sighted if they were visually impaired using the device with their self-motion as well. Of course, this is for egocentric tasks, which we know the visually impaired are very good at. Um, but what we were excited was to see that the visually impaired were also able to integrate and have strong performance uh, as good as the sighted in terms of their precision in the allocentric tasks as well. So where they have to really think about where the objects are located in relation to one another rather than their starting point. Uh, so we're really excited about that work. Now, can the learning process be made more efficient? Um, well, we're trying something new right now. So one thing we're trying is we developed an app game a few years ago um, that we've now had a chance to test where we gamify learning to see with sound for lots of different uh, shapes, objects, you know, all just with on a mobile phone as one way of training to do it. And it's actually a pretty fun game for learning how to do it. Uh, and then we tested people in where tasks. Um, one in terms of just tabletop localization, but another where they had to navigate an indoor space and avoid obstacles within that space. And our initial results are encouraging and giving us some sense of how much training is helpful for these types of tasks. Uh, for the tabletop tasks, the sort of biggest drop we found, and lower is better here in terms of the speed while remaining accurate in this task, uh, was after eight hours of training uh, with the phone um, training game. And we found uh, even greater results for the actual obstacle avoidance when the indoor navigation task, where without any training, people were sort of randomly equally successful, half successful, or failing to do this using uh, seeing with sound. After just three hours of playing the game, uh, we saw the proportion of successful trials jump up uh, and eight hours just add on a little bit more uh, improvement in their performance. And keep in mind, that's going from playing a game on a phone screen to a real three-dimensional environment. And so we're really excited about that work. Uh, and here's just an example video of one of the training tasks we had someone go through. Um, and we've really been exploring through a lot of our papers the ways this can inform spatial processing in general, as well as the potential implications for sensory substitution as an application for the visually impaired. Uh, so just to wrap up, um, key ideas 
Visual experience helps maintain map-like structures in the brain, and that has implications for how we represent the space around us and how we interact with it. Um, but the important thing is we perceive with the brain, not just with our various sensory receptors. And so I think the promise of sensory substitution is that we can sort of hack into the brain and provide information through another sense that can enable people to be able to represent things and respond to things and even navigate in ways um, as if they could see, even if they're doing it with sound. Uh, and one recent paper uh, with uh, Typhoon and Vanessa here, we outlined a number of ways we can take advantage of our knowledge about how multisensory integration and cooperation works to think about inclusive design for uh, many things that we could do with representing information in ways that people can process visually or through sound or through touch. Uh, so with that, uh, let's turn over to some questions. Uh, thank you very much for all of you coming. And um, I'll let Colette run things, but it looks like we have a few questions in the chat I could probably start with. 